Hi, I'm Joe Johnson, and I'm the senior pastor here at Goffstown Harvest Christian Church, and I'm glad you're checking out our program, which we call His Kingdom Now. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, He was clear. He didn't come to bring another religion. He came to open up a relationship with God through the kingdom of heaven. And the most amazing news about this is we have access to that kingdom just as much as He does. And so what we're going to do today as we open up the Word of God is we're going to find out how the stuff works. We're going to learn what He said, how to cooperate with His kingdom, so that all of us can walk with God and see amazing things, not just in this generation, but we can know for sure that we can live with Him forever and ever. So enjoy the service. I look forward to talking to you at the end. Amen. Are we ready to get into the Word of God? All right, let's pray. We got some pretty serious things to talk about today. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, we want to thank you for opening up the principles uh, uh, of heaven itself. And when Jesus came uh, to the earth, certainly we're very grateful that he died on the cross for our sins, but he spent three and a half years teaching concerning the kingdom. This is how things work. And so, Father, we're just so thankful you didn't want us ignorant on how these things work anymore. And so today uh, we're going to discuss things. You, you're very interested in leadership and uh, politics. You're very interested in people, the people that lead other people. And there's some things that are really crucial to you. And we're going to discuss these things. And Father, I'm trusting in your grace, your anointing, which is your enablement, that the things that come out of my heart are taken the right way, that your presence is upon them. And as we say many times here, uh, you've not placed me here to tell people what to think, uh, but I certainly want to give them a whole lot to think about. So we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. All right. Well, uh, can anybody tell me what we've got going on here in the country here this Tuesday? Uh -huh. Does anybody have any idea what's coming up? Well, the elections. We every four years uh, for the president of the United States, we have elections. There's elections going to be for the House of Representatives and the Senate as well. So these are some very important things that are happening in our lives. And uh, it's important that we're educated as far as what should be um, our perspective when it goes when it comes to uh, voting, when it comes to community involvement. And I know that there's, uh, there are a number of Christians that just stay out of it. They say, oh, politics is the devil. It's just all about Jesus. Or you'll say, well, you know what? I don't like either one, so you know, I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to get involved. And uh, a couple things, and like I said, I want to reiterate, my job, I'm not going to, as the pastor of this church, this church is not representing any candidate. I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not even going to tell you who I'm going to vote for. That's not what I want to do here. But what I want to do is I want to give you information, uh, some things to think about so that you could uh, come to conclusions and then act accordingly. But there are those uh, that will say, well, you know, pastor, I, you know, I don't like either one. I think I'm going to go ahead and I, I'm just going to stay out of that. And well, here, here's, here's the thing. Uh, if you're an American citizen, you know, stewardship is like this really big thing to God. Like he's really into taking care of what it is that he's given you. And if you're an American citizen, then we have a responsibility before God to steward how things work here in our nation. And voting is very important. We're not supposed to have the option of not being involved in this. And we're going to dis we'll discuss some things today, but um, in the and oh, can, we'll just get this out there right now too. What does the scriptures say about how many? have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, Donald Trump is a creep and Joe Biden has been a creep. Can we just get that over with? Okay, the accuser of the brethren, who is constantly, he's a fault finder. He's a fault finder and he does it in your own life. If you know what it's like to, to live and be condemned all the time, you're this. And, listen, you can, you can have a godly sorrow where you go, I'm sorry. Let's see, any kids in here? Okay. There's a big difference between I'm sorry versus I suck. That's right. That's right. Big difference between the two. And there's no question whether it's the, the human being all the way up to nations. There's things that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, including nations. But there is a major difference between 
repent, get it right, versus you stink, you're evil, you shouldn't even exist. Condemnation. And there's a lot of voices out there that are really great at condemning and telling everybody how rotten they are instead of, okay, let's remedy what is obviously a problem. And there's two different... the the. Uh, uh, the root cause or the end result of these things are two completely different things. And I thank God for repentance. Repentance allows me to say, I'm so sorry. Wow, let's get back on the horse and let's make it right. Versus you're evil, you rotten, the whole thing needs to be discarded. Uh, thank God that God doesn't want to discard me. Well, it's the same thing with a nation as well. All right, And so uh, that I don't want to vote or I don't want to get involved. If, you, if you're an American citizen, you have a responsibility to steward uh, what God has given, has given you. And, and, and again, I've always thought it was funny. People say, well, if so-and-so wins, I'm leaving the country. Why won't they just leave the country? I mean, why won't we just get out of here, all right? And just do it. You're so great. We're going to be so suffer. We're going to suffer so much because you don't live here. Just go. But if you do move, then obey the laws that they have in their country too and be faithful to steward them. And so what we want to do today is we want to talk about uh, the Word of God, what maybe some, the, not maybe, the perspectives we need to have as His children. And again, I should be all right getting us still here, 1130, so an hour and a half service total. But I also want you to know, I don't want to feel rushed today. Amen. And I'll feel it. There's some really crazy things that are going on. And there's always going to be crazy things. But, you know, I've had the opportunity to talk to folks that, again, I'm 57 years old and the generation after, uh, after me and maybe some even after that. And honestly, now for myself, I can say this, but I haven't talked to someone of the generation older than me that hasn't said there's never been a time like this, ever. And they, these are folks that went through uh, Martin Luther King and the race riot in Vietnam. And so there has never, there really are people say, well, it's the greatest election that's ever had. Maybe this time that might be true. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, they always say that, but... I, please, let's take our time. And like I said, I want to have a discussion. I'm going to uh, share some principles, share what the Word of God has to say, but I have absolutely no problem opening up the floor and, uh, and having a discussion. But I'm going to make this clear one more time before we get going. Uh, Goffstown Harvest does not endorse a particular candidate. I am allowed to as a private citizen, but I'm not even going there. But this is about a discussion. I'm not here to say who's right or some wrong. But if we're Christians, if we're children of God, then I'm wondering, and by the, by the way, the answer is yes, if maybe God has some things to say about these things. So let's get, let's get going. How dare you say that? Uh, at one point in Jesus' ministry, he's, <laughs> people said, by what authority are you teaching these things? What gives you the right? Where do you get off saying these things? Well, before we get going, what I want to do is uh, the how dare you say that is not me. It's the word of God. Before we get going, and those of you who've been around me any amount of time, you probably can guess where we're going on this. How can we, because there are those that say, oh, there's lots of religions out there. Yeah, they are, and they are all the same. Jesus has nothing to do with religion. Jesus deals in reality, not religion. So why, if we're, going to, if we're going to appeal to the scriptures, to the word of God, how can they say that? How, what can we know that, that absolutely gives us the right, the authority, and confidence to believe that the principles we're about to talk about are accurate? Guess where we're going? 1 Corinthians 15. This is the Apostle Paul. For I delivered to you as of first importance. Say first importance. All right, in other words, what he's about to talk about, above all else, you got to get this. Of everything you learn in all the entire New Testament, you've got to know this. Uh, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. In other words, the Word of God specifically stated 
who Jesus is, what he was going to do and accomplish, and what's made available for us. The word of God, they appealed to the word of God concerning, number one, that he was going to die for our sins, right? And that he was buried, watch, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now watch this, watch this list. And that he appeared to Cephas, that was Peter, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Well, he kept appearing. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So first of all, the apostle Paul, and we've talked about this regularly here, the, the the pressure is, is regularly to get us into a conversation we don't belong in, and usually it revolves around who's right, who's wrong, what religion has the most to offer. Well, according to this, it all starts with Jesus raising from the dead, period. If, if you go through the New Testament, you find they are continually appealing not to their behavior rules, but the resurrection, they continually go back. And here's the thing. If the, he said, look, if you don't believe me, look at this list of people. And by the way, he's still appearing to people. He's still, he's showing up to people here in America, the, in um, Iran, and in the Middle Eastern countries. There are incredible reports of him appearing in folks that were zealous for Islam and just brutal people, kind of like Paul are having these open visions, and they're coming to Christ, and incredible things are happening. So he's still appearing. Now let's watch and see how important this is. And if Christ, so let's just, so let's just say it doesn't, it, it's not true. Let's just say, ah, John, take you guys are all smoking crack. I don't believe in the resurrection. Well, let's watch this. Let's see what he had to say. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Notice that your faith, your belief system hinges solely on the resurrection. Mankind, we did not need a new behavior system. That's not what we lost in the Garden of Eden. You've heard me say this ad nauseum because it brings us back to the fundamental of what God has done through Christ and the resurrection. And he says, look, if Jesus didn't, if this resurrection is crazy nonsense, watch this, his preaching is useless. Our faith is useless. You have no business being in this room today if there wasn't a resurrection. We need to think about these things. And we apostles would all be lying about God. We've got no business reading letters by people that were bald-faced liars if the resurrection didn't take place. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And our hope in Christ is only, is only for this life. And if the, uh, our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. The discussion is not who's the nicest. The discussion is Jesus rose from the dead. Game, set, match. Now, why is that important? Because if the resurrection is true, it's all true. You don't really believe in an ark. Jesus did. He talked about it. Well, why would we believe Jesus? Because he rose again from the dead, and if he didn't, my faith is useless. You don't really believe a fish swallowed a guy. Well, Jesus talked about that too. I absolutely, well, how can you possibly believe that? Because Jesus rose again from the dead, was seen by 500 people at a time, and my faith is useless if he didn't rose again. And see, this is important because when this is established, the evidence, like the final stamp, wham, the evidence that the scriptures are true, because that is true, if the word of God has anything to say about politics, it's true. It's true. So this is where we need to start, you guys, as we go into this. No, what, this is what the scriptures say, and this is where we, this is the, the diving board, the springboard into where we're going. Notice the right, Paul says this in the letter of Philippians. He says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Our worldviews, my friends, including politics, must be filtered through heaven's perspective because that is where our citizenship comes from. And the reason why this is important is, is when you're dealing with elections, and I know there's things continually, and we naturally, we don't even think about what we're doing it. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote this party because my, my parents and my grandparents, they voted this party. Or my, I'm going to vote this way because my friends voted this way. And we're finding out here that the basis for our voting isn't supposed to have anything to do with the earth anymore. Because now our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior. Not only is he coming from heaven, but from it, what does the scripture say about us being seated together in a heavenly place with Christ Jesus? See, we're also there too. See, and this is going to be huge because both sides are doing everything they can. And and again, no side has it. It's human nature to try to manipulate and try to convince and and color and shade to get you to be convinced to their way. Well, what we can do is we're going to neutralize all that. And why don't we just go because if the resurrection's resurrection's not true, uh, as a matter of fact, we can just leave right now because our faith is useless. But if it is, and it is, then we can, we can what well, does the scriptures, because the scriptures, not only our salvation, did the scriptures talk about the resurrection of who Jesus is, the scriptures, which means if they're right about our salvation, if they're right about who Jesus, and they spoke about these things, and they were 100% accurate, what we're about to hear from the word of God is 100% accurate about the affairs of human beings on this earth and who leads us. And... I know I've said this many times before, but I'm going to have to say it again. You ready? I didn't write this. It's not my fault. And that's why we, you know, we, we started with, I'm not, gonna, I, I'm not telling you what to think. I'm, we're going to read this together and let you come to your own conclusions. Um, and I'll say this right now. Listen, if you're a Christian... If you're a child of God, is there a scripture verse anywhere that says you're allowed to be offended? Just one. That, yep, get offended, walk in unforgiveness, hate your brother. Are you allowed to do that? Okay, that means you're not allowed to be offended at what the word of God has to say. And I know there's folks, I know there's ministers, I have minister friends of mine that won't talk about some of these things because they are afraid of losing people, because they're afraid people will get offended. I'm not allowed, you're not allowed to get offended anyway, but a man of God is not here to decide what it said. It's his job just to repeat it. It's not my fault. Oh, and by the way, these things have been here for 2,000 years. Okay, there's like, (laughs) people have come and gone trying to destroy the veracity of this thing. They can't because they won't because it's impossible. Okay, so... Are we ready to let the word of God, because we're citizens of heaven, guide our views and our actions? Now, there's tons of things that we could talk about. And what I did was, is I picked three things. There's so many things in the, at the end of the service. I, I'll probably, tomorrow, be going, man, I could have gone here. I could have gone. I mean, there's just so much, right? But as I, w- as I was praying about it this week, and certainly this morning when I get up and I just get quiet and I just listen to where the Holy Spirit wants to take me, there's so many things. I believe that there's three specific areas that um, are of the utmost importance that we talk about principally, okay? So once again, our worldviews, including politics, must be filtered through heaven's perspective. Uh, that is our citizenship now. And from heaven's perspective, it's not about personality, political party, but eternal principle and platform. My friends, you're not voting for President Trump, nor are you voting for Vice President Biden. We're voting for principle. We're voting, it's a matter of voting a platform, not the personality. And this is a big thing because you'll have folks that can have the personality in taking you and lead you off the bridge. And so we have to be careful. And again, I'm going to make it very clear. Nobody has a monopoly on this. No one. Because we're, if all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, then we already admit that you're not going to be able to... The accuser of the brethren is going to find things wrong with President Trump, and the accuser of the brethren is going to find things wrong with Mr. Biden as well. So now, but if we go back and let's read principle, 
because our citizenship is in heaven, then maybe we can look at some things and do it right. So I said there's about three things. Let's begin to consider some things carefully. Biblical, scriptural principles. These are things that are important to God. So the first principle I want to talk about today, what about politics and voting itself? What do the scriptures have to say about politics? What do they say about voting? Does the word of God address these things? Well, I just don't believe a Christian should be involved in politics. I don't believe, you know, there's all those evangelical leaders that are hanging around with President Trump. I think it's all wrong. They just want to be in power. They just want to, I mean, it's just, it's both ends of the spectrum. Why don't we see what happened in the word of God? First of all, speaking of politics, and I use this one regularly because it doesn't get any more clear. In Mark chapter six, speaking of John the Baptist, for Herod, who was Herod? There was, yeah, okay, he's like the ruler of this whole area. Now watch this. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And so Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod, watch this, Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. And when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. My friends, our political leaders need godly voices in their life. So for a Christian to say these guys shouldn't be hanging out with political leaders, they're ignorant scripturally. Listen, and it doesn't seem like John the Baptist was saying something that necessarily Herod was going to want to hear. All right, our leaders, listen, a politician is a politician. A man of God is a man of God. We get in trouble when, if someone's a preacher that's not anointed to be involved in politics, stay out. But God forbid, and we see it all the time, one of the most disgusting things on a planet is a political leader quoting a verse thinking they have some spiritual authority to even use that verse. That doesn't belong to them. The man of God works, and this has gone all the way back to the, in the old covenant, the prophets would speak and counsel to the kings, and even today we find out, and listen, even Jesus himself, we've talked about this before, the Pharisees were not just the religious leaders and the lawyers as well. They didn't just lead religiously, they led the people. The Pharisees worked hand in hand with the Romans, and so when Jesus was dealing with these guys, he was dealing with politicians as well. The idea that the a man of God or even the Christian church does not get involved in the leadership of men is foolish. And you've heard me quote this many times. Charles Finney, a lawyer, personally met Christ, changed his life, arguably the greatest revivalist ever lived. He said, if there's, if there's a problem in your culture, if there's problems in your government, if there's problems in the people across the board, the common denominator said it started in the pulpit. Because the, the man of God was not dealing with what is right and wrong. Let people, let the politician rule and steward and govern over the people. And I'm going to rephrase that. That's not right. Because in our system, they're supposed to serve the people. They're supposed to steward us and take care of us. But again, they should be able to be experts in their field while the man of God, and obviously this is what happened, that the Lord had, had set it up so he, John, Herod would regularly listen to John. It is scriptural, and I thank God for godly leaders speaking into President Trump's life. It doesn't matter whether you like him or you hate him, it's godly, it's God's will for men and women of God to be speaking to political leaders. Now notice, John still lost his life. It was immaterial how the politician was going to listen to the voice. God still sent a voice. He still sent it. Now, the other side of that coin is a, a preacher, if you're watching, John's sake, don't you ever forget, we don't trust in political leaders because they'll just as quickly turn on you as anybody else. You remember that. And there are folks that use politics because they like being on the stage with political leaders. They like the power. They like the image. And that's just as wrong as anybody else being manipulated. Okay, let's keep going. Let's talk about vote. And again, there's so many different examples, but again, I want to take us through these things. Acts chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. And the 12 summoned the full number of disciples 
and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men. Now watch, there's qualifications for these people. Brothers, you pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. I want us to see now. Same thing happened with Moses. God told him to do the same thing after Jethro had come to him as far as leadership. I want you to notice here, when, the, when uh, the Peter had said, okay, we need to get some leadership in here, notice, did the instructions... For the people we're going to serve, do you see the words fasting and prayer and supplication and waiting on God involved in any of this? No, they're, they're character qualifications, and he left it to the people. There are times, listen, and in the United States of America, our system of government depends on the people judging the character and the qualifications, and we get to choose, instead of it being passed on through bloodline, we get to choose based on qualifications and character who we want to serve and lead us. This is not, well, I just don't think God's into politics. Obviously, he is. The, gover the, the, the scriptures tell us that the government of God rests on Jesus' shoulders. And um, I'll remind you of this again. Politics started before we were created. How do you think Lucifer got a third of the angels to fall? He played politics on who was in charge and who was, in, who, in, and who was running things. And he wanted to be just like them. He wanted to be just like the Most High. And he was able to manipulate as the accuser, as the deceiver, and get people to actually rebel against authority. Government rebellion has been around since before mankind was even around, okay? So when it comes to politics and voting and being around political leaders, we find out that the Word of God has people speaking to our leaders, and also there are times to where, now you should be praying and seeking God anyway, but it was according to character, not Holy Spirit witness, that they chose these people. And we certainly want to pray and we want to trust God for our decisions. But it, in the system that we live in as American citizens, it is our job to vet those who want to serve us, those who want to take care of us, okay? So this is of God. The scriptures certainly endorse these things. So the next thing we want to talk about, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this one. What about life? What about life? Our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. John 10.10, 10, I came that they ha may have life and have it abundantly. Um, what, what did he do to death in this case? He was talking about spiritual death and that which was separating from Christ. What, what, what did he do to death? Abolish. Now, it didn't just snuff the thing out. What, is, what, do you, what, what images do you get in your head when you see the word abolish? Okay, like he's really serious about this thing. Like he didn't just file 13 this thing. He control, alt, delete, scrub the hard drive. All right, just it's gone. The, and he came that we have life and have it life more abundantly. God is into life. Do you remember... Um, and I was, uh, and I saw this post and it got me going. I was reading about Noah uh, and the flood uh, the other day this week. Our, our plane got broken. I was stuck in uh, Raleigh Durham for four days, and so I had time. And I was reading the scriptures and I was reading about Noah. And, and um, there's a point in there where the Lord tells us that He even regretted making us. Do you remember what was going on that bothered His heart so much? And violence to fulfill resulting in death filled the earth. Violence was filling the earth. He is a God of life. And I'll just tangent come right back. The scriptures, the Apostle Paul talking about the end times when he talked about people who were unruly, disobedient to parents, selfish, violent, haters, and the Apostle Paul, or the Lord through the Apostle Paul said, stay away from such people. Political activism based on violence and intimidation is never of God. Right. 
He hates it, and you have no business bending your knee to it. Remember, the scriptures tell us that we're not even allowed to fear. Bullies are not supposed to direct our, our political decisions. So he loves, he abolished death and brought life. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So if we're children of God, if we're sons of God through our faith in Jesus Christ, then our job is not necessary, not only to defend principle, but defend life itself. In him was life, and that life is the light of man. So if God is into life, what, who maybe would be authoring the opposite of violence and death? Well, certainly the kingdom of darkness run by Lucifer. We are supposed to be lovers and defenders of life. Now, you probably know where I'm going, but it's more than this. Every day, listen, I come into the house of God because there's life in this place. It's cool to see all you guys. But in here, when I go home, I rejoice because the God of life has opened up the doors to heaven, and I'm going to celebrate every day and thank him for life. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Do you think maybe God is involved even before a person is born? We're going to keep going just so you have enough evidences in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let everything be established, right? Why don't we keep going? Isaiah 49.1, the Lord called me before I was born, while I was in my mother's womb, he named me. Paul, the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Galatians, but when God who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me. It, are, are we citizens of heaven? Okay, so we're hearing what heaven thinks about life, including human life, and what God thinks, of, and that means what we are supposed to think about human beings even before they are naturally born, because we find God himself is intimately involved in these things. And I'm going to leave us with this. How many of you all remember Dr. Bernard Nathanson? Okay, now, before we go on, Dr. Nathanson, I want you to write that name down and you need to research him. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, he spearheaded in the 60s and 70s, he, by his own admission, was responsible for, I believe, over 30,000 abortions. He's the one who started narrow. He's the one that began, and he worked. Oh, and by the way, we know all this because he came to Christ later in his life and he spilled the beans. And he told, and listen, he gave, a, he produced a movie called The Silent Scream. President Ronald Reagan was pro-abortion until he saw The Silent Scream, had his entire staff watch the video and watch what really happens during an abortion, and that's when he flipped pro-life. Well, Dr. Nathanson was in charge. He was the one, and I want you to, because I don't take my word for it, but Dr. Nathanson was in charge of spearheading Roe versus Wade. Now, notice one of his admissions. You ready? We fed the public a line of deceit, dishonesty, a fabrication of statistics and figures. We succeeded in breaking down the laws limiting abortions because the time was right and the news media cooperated. If they're doing this in the 60s and 70s, please don't trust your favorite news source. We sensationalized the effects of illegal abortions and fabricated polls which indicated that 85% of the public favored unrestricted abortion when we knew it was only 5%. 
Oh, by the way, when you research him, you'll find out. He said, we know. We knew it, and they know it now. We know life begins at conception. They knew it back then. Watch what they did. And research him. Make sure I'm not lying to you. We unashamedly lied, and yet our statements were quoted by the media as though they had been written in law. Dr. Bernard Nathanson. They knew. They still know. Life begins at conception. The doctors know it's not it's a second body. It's not one person's body. Now, before we keep going, let me ask you this. Is there any sin that's not forgiven? No, I absolutely believe Dr. Nathanson is in is him today. And anybody that has had or had believed in abortion, I'm convinced Christ's blood is stronger than any sin. Okay? And there's healing and there's restoration. But my friends, listen, oh, the media is still at it. I just saw a video. I saw a guy who uh, lives in Utah. This is a fact, and I researched it to make sure it's true. Utah just passed, and it's interesting the things that are coming out just three, four days before the election. Mass cases of COVID everywhere. This is in Iowa or Idaho. And they used the emergency system on phones and texts and sent them throughout all the state about you need to stay home. It's so terrible. It's so awful out there. Well, this fellow lives in the state. He had this happen. He, when he posted that, that, wait a minute, what's going on here? Hundreds of folks from mostly uh, red states said, I can't believe it. I'm getting the same thing. Trying to scare the daylights out of us to not go and vote. Now, I'm not a doctor, and people that get sick from this thing are do- die. No question. But the moment something so serious is being used to manipulate instead of educate and protect, we have a serious, serious problem. And if they did this over abortion, you can't trust it. We can trust the Word of God. This is why I keep telling you, don't take my word for it. You go back and study it. Don't let me try to manipulate you guys. I'm just giving you stuff to think about. And this is where Pastor Joe Johnson, this is not Gosstown Harvest Christian Church, stand, because we don't say where we stand, but as a citizen, if someone believes it's all right to murder this child, though they're still in the womb, I cannot vote for you, no matter what you promise me. If you believe you can murder that child two weeks before it's born because someone has some right, I can never vote for you. Because he has come that we would have life and life more abundantly. Well, Pastor, it's easy for you to say driving around in those $35 million jets and you get your BMW and you get your $3,500 square foot house. And everybody's so happy and so healthy. Is my daughter Lindsay in here? No, she's in my place. Robin was just 18. I was 21 when she got pregnant. We could have had an abortion. We risked everything to protect the life of my child. And I'm a happy man. And you'll hear, and you'll hear me say regularly, Lindsay, you're a great choice. Because I never want her to think Okay, that we only did this because of her. I fought for life and we had nothing. My money is where my mouth is. And by God's grace, anybody can make it work. Because see, if that child is in God's eyes before they're born, you don't think for one second, even if you don't know much how the stuff works, you don't think God is personally involved in making sure he, she turns out all right? My money's where my mouth is. I was 21, she was 18. 36 almost years of marriage. And I'm a blessed man today because I've been following his principles, not perfectly, 
but that started with the life of my child. And I know we're on live stream. If someone believes, this is me, it's all right to murder this child, you might as well not even have your commercials on my television set because I cannot listen to you. I cannot. I will not listen to you. doesn't matter what your idea is on taxes and politics and all that. And today we don't even go there. But it has to start with life. And if you're watching by today, it will be worth having that child. Now that also, I'm going to say this, I would like to see personally, and now there's great uh, organizations out there, I would like to see, uh, let's see, there's been over 60 million abortions through Planned Parenthood. 60 million. I wonder if we took that cash and however, whatever it would take, I wonder if we took the cash and the energies on saving, the, not just to get having a picket sign and talking about the evils of abortion, I think we can do better making sure there's avenues. Okay, if we want to keep these children alive, we certainly should be able to take better care of them as well too. Now, I don't know what that answer is, but I have no problem saying, all right, you're not, you're against abortion. I, I'll be right there to get into any kind of discussion, panel, whatever, to even more be able to take care of the living. But we are not allowed to murder children. That child is a child of God. What about identity politics? Now, I'm going to define it for you because I don't, now you're like, yeah, okay, I know where you're going. Black Lives Matter. No, we're going to broaden it up. No, I'm not going to do it. I won't do this to you people. I won't do it. Let's read the definition and we'll see. It's not, it's not, it's, it's a lot of things. Identity politics is a term that describes a political approach wherein people of a particular religion, race, social background, class, or other identifying factor form exclusive socio-political alliances moving away from broad-based coalitional politics. Basically, identity politics is, what about me? I want to be first at the table. What are you going to do for me? Now, part of that, okay, but what begins to happen when we pander and manipulate things to turn and notice what it says moving away from broad-based coalitional politics? How many times do you hear people say, well, I just wish they'd work across the aisle? Not going to happen if you believe in identity politics because that can't happen because you're dividing everybody against each other because you've got something I want and I need to take it from you. Do you think maybe the Word of God has anything to say about these things? It does. Galatians 3, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male, female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In this new life, the Apostle Paul says, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Gentile, whether you're circumcised, uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, whether you're a slave, free, slave or whether you're free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. So before we read the next verses, notice from heaven's perspective, it's not a matter anymore of the color of your skin, what synagogue or church you go to. We have been elevated above those things to recognize that we are eternal beings. God lives on the inside of us, and from heaven's perspective, God wants equity, not preference. Equity, not preference. And I'm going to prove that to you. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. Identity politics says, oh, look at how bad they have. Let me... The issue isn't how bad someone has it. It doesn't matter whether they're rich. It doesn't matter whether they're poor. It doesn't matter if they're purple or they're from Mars. God wants what's right. And we can only have fair judgment when we step back and we have a system of what is right and how to judge by that. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias. 
doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. And how many times do we see in the Word of God, the, uh, the writer, Jay, Pastor James, Pastor Jim, he said, look, you guys, you're letting these rich people come in, and you're taking the poor people and they're putting them back. What are you doing? You can't do that. You're showing partiality to these people. And by the way, a lot of these rich people... And, uh, uh, don't get nervous if you have any extra money now. I'll, I'll get to this. But in this case, these guys are causing you trouble, even throwing you in jail. Why are you giving them preferential treatment? In other words, sit Bill Gates next to the guy who just rolled in from the street and let them love each other. Amen. Period. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. The victim is the victim, not the criminal. And we're living in a society today that has miles of excuses for the criminal and to where now they're even talking about defunding the police. Now, they'll say, well, what we really mean is, is instead of the police doing some of these social things and stuff like that, there might be some discussions. But I will say, look up defunding the police and find what countries did that before Marxism totally came in and take over. I'm going to quote this here in a minute. Wisdom is justified by our children. In other words, all you got to do is stand back and watch for a while and see what does it produce. Do you know why the, the, there's such a problem in our country now? Because everybody's worried about, you know, even the police are worried? Because now the criminal has more rights than even the police. And the accuser of the brethren, this is a lie that most policemen are bad people. It's a lie that white people are bad people. It's a lie that black people are bad people. Thank, did you know, and I, Robin just sent me something. This is really good. Did you know Martin Luther, if you, Martin Luther King? And uh, I'd have to, maybe one of you guys can pull this up. Did you know if you were going to be part of the, um, what was his movement? Civil rights movement? Okay. You actually, if you're going to be like endorsed and be part of that, and you're talking about hundreds and thousands of people, you had to fill out a card. Okay, in that card, you swore that you were not going to depend on violence, that you were going to meditate the scriptures every day, that it was a matter of character. In other words, godly principles saying we need right and wrong elev is elevated above skin, race, and religion. Right and wrong has nothing to do with it because right and wrong is based on eternal principles. And this is why the enemy, and this is what's happened before we go to the next one. Well, you know, this person thinks this is right and this is... Do you, you want to know why we've gotten there? Because if you have pressed in our culture to get God out of the conversation, now if there is not the God, what you've done is you've created a culture of lots of gods. And all these gods want to impose their right and wrong upon the other gods. <laughs> That's what's going on right now. And just 30, even 40 years later, I mean, there's always been, there's been division in our country and stuff, but at least there used to be, even with parties, a, a fear of God and a love for trying to make this thing right. People are going to fight, and people have shot each other and been assassinated and stuff. It's not like evil's like got this monopoly in our generation. But once we get rid of the idea of the fear of God and in God we trust, now we're all gods. And now the gods, like on Mount Olympus, get to fight it out. And that's what's happening today. And it's not good. The victim is the victim, not the criminal. And the victim needs to be defended. And if you've been enslaved and you've been a victim, then you need to be defended. If you've been falsely accused, you need to be defended. Right is right, wrong is wrong. So what about welfare? So now we've talked about life. We've talked about um, identity and playing people against each other. Okay? Victimization, pitting this person against that person, causing us to be tribal. And right and wrong is now determined by your tribe, not something higher where God has decreed this is how you're going to think. Now remember, why do we believe the scriptures? Because Christ rose again from the dead, right? Okay, so let's talk about welfare. Capitalism. An epic economic system based on the private ownership of the means of production. Say private ownership. Of the means of production and their operation for profit. Central characteristics of capitalism include capital accumulation, competitive markets, 
a price system, watch this, private property and the recognition of property rights and voluntary exchange and wage labor. Okay? Socialism and Karl Marx, what they believe, and we're going to talk about because what does the Word of God have to say about our economics and taking care of the poor? It is appealed that because the victims are impoverished, we need to take involuntarily from someone to the point to where now centralized government begins to oversee private property, not the individual owning private property and being responsible to take care of the poor. I'm going to get this out there right now, and I didn't have time because of all the verses. The scriptures are very clear. If, you, if you're blessed, you need to help and share. But the scriptures never say take it from the rich. Never says take it from them, but the rich are commanded, you better help out. And didn't we take three weeks and talk about what the offer? We're blessed so that we can be blessed to be a blessing. You have a responsibility with your blessings to help your fellow man. But nowhere in the New Testament is the government endorsed to come and take something from you. You know what this word means to me? I'll just sum it up in one simple phrase. Personal responsibility. I'm responsible for my own life. Do you think the scriptures have something to say about this? For the kingdom of heaven, when Christ returns, Jesus was teaching about this. He said, we all know the story uh, or the, the lesson. For the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Say this with me, each according to his ability. God does not think in terms of what's fair. See, the world's fairness would sit there and go, how dare he give one guy five, another two, another one? We need to step in and take from the five. Notice the qualifier was each according to his ability. You guys, there's some of you in this room, you are not near as good at things that I am. You know I'm going to finish it, though. But you guys, there's things I'm not near as good as you are because I have been given my own personal ability. And you know what that tells me? I'm not allowed to covet and be jealous of what you have anymore. We're going to find out. I have one and one only responsibility. And listen, well, you don't understand my background. I don't need to. If you even had a quarter of a millionth of one talent, we're going to find out what you're supposed to be doing with it. And it isn't taking from someone else to make it fair. And it's amen, not because I didn't write this. We're finding, how does God think? Okay, remember, we're citizens of heaven. It doesn't matter what your politician told you or your grandma told you. Because that's not what this is about. Notice, so each person was given different, was entrusted with different amounts. And that, and notice that the master, and we know that's the father, he's determined, listen, he hasn't, just like acorns are 60 feet tall, and the nice ornamental grass I have in my landscaping might be three foot tall, God created each one to have its own particular beauty. Do not listen to the Marxist and the agitator tell you, you need to have what the other person has. You're not as good as they are. You need to give it to them. He's getting your eyes off of the amazing creation that you are personally and trying to get you into one of the most basic commandments, thou shall not covet thy neighbor's Amen. goods. And he stirs that part of our fallen nature that greeds and wants what the other person has instead of recognizing God's into personal accountability. We're going to see just how important this is to him right now. So here's the guy with the one talent. Now, before we go on, what happened to the guy with the five talents? What did he do? Yeah, he got five more. What did the guy with the two talents do? What did he do? Okay, when he went from five to ten and two to five, did these guys, was it taken from somebody else or out of their own industry and personal accountability, they took what they had been given? Well, Pastor Joe, you don't understand my upbringing. Listen, the moment I left everything, including my dad, he'll verify. When I got out of Bible school, he said, come to Ohio, I'll buy you a house. I'll take care of you. Multiple times, I had nothing. 
Zero. I remember sharing this story with some friends. How are we all doing? You good? Okay. I was sharing this story with some folks of a certain persuasion. You know, oh, people are just being beat down and people, I, I, of course people are being beaten down. They've been beaten down since Lucifer tricked Adam and Eve. He beats people down. Okay, welcome to our world. I can't change the cards you were dealt with, but we were all dealt cards. And even if I had some golden spoon, I didn't. We left, I, we started with nothing. I almost lost stuff multiple times. So I'm sharing this testimony, right? In other words, hey, I'm evidence that by the grace of God and hard work, that look what we can become. And I'm not ashamed of people. And people say, you know, people say, do, you, do, you think, do you think a pastor should drive around in a BMW? Well, isn't the answer obvious? Well, what will people think? They get mad at me when I don't have nothing. They get mad at me when I have something. I might as well let my dad take good care of me, especially since we start with nothing. So no, I may not understand this neighborhood. I may not understand that, but I understand pain and I understand nothing. And I understand having one meal and nothing else left over and over and seeing the goodness of my God, his faithfulness and my hard work and diligence working together. Well, I was sharing this. You know what? People are trained. They got on me. I called them piranhas before I unfriended them. Oh, you're just prideful. You just don't understand. You just did. So instead of bragging and talking about how good our God is and how muscles, including financial ones, get bigger the more you exercise them, all of a sudden I was one of those oppressive capitalist white supremacists. Let's see what happened with the guy who had nothing and did nothing with it. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed. Then you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. Seems like in God's eyes, the guy who's faithful gets more. It's not ripped out of his hands through tax after tax after tax. Because, see, that's not fair. That's not, that's not judging with partiality. For to everyone who has, what? You mean God's into prosperity? More will be given, and he will have an abundance, and we already know who he's talking about, for, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Honor widows, because a lot of these verses, a lot of folks, they either blow off of them. Personally, you're not going to hear those from a politician. No. Especially one who wants to get certain votes. No. Thank God for Dr. Martin Luther King. Man, I think, you know, not a single miracle that we know as far as healing and blind eyes, but that man was a prophet to our nation. Amen. Honor widows who are truly widows. Watch this. Okay, this is how the church is supposed to take offerings. Because there's an idea that the church is offered for. You know, we get calls from people just during the week. Uh, they don't go to church. They don't work, but they're calling for church to give them free money. Let's see what the church, what those, this is what the scriptures have to say. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first, say first, learn to show godliness to their own household and make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. Watch. So she's working. She's honoring God. She's doing God work. Watch, Watch, there's another kind of widow. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well. In other words, these are not optional. Remember, we're citizens of heaven. So that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. We've heard those verses. In other words, if you have a need, parents, you have every right in the world to call your kids and say, I need help and you need to give it to me. He didn't say burden the church first. He said, you'll have your own family. And if your family denies taking care of mom and dad, mom and dad, you took care of them. I've done that to my dad. Dad, you okay? Dad, you all right? How can I help you? And he's working. He's helping to do some things. Because I'm going to take care of them. 
Not that he necessarily needs to, but the first place, if we're in need, we have our own family. You don't become a burden to someone else, whether it's the church or the local government. First place you go is to your family. And if you have a God-fearing family, listen, kids, Lindsay, Stephanie, Joey, Christian, need to help dad out. (laughs) I still haven't finished paying off those new golf clubs. See if there's any other stipulations with giving. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command in the name of the Lord Jesus. Stay away from all believers who live idle lives. You know what that means? Stay away from all believers that don't work. Lazy. Slothful. Remember, we're finding out what God thinks about increase, right? And how to get resources. Does it say anywhere that we don't take care of the poor? No, right now we're talking about personal accountability. That's all we're talking about right now. If the scriptures are clear, remember the poor. For you know that you ought to imitate us. We were not idle, slothful, lazy when we were with you. We never accepted food from anyone without paying for it. We worked hard day and night so we could not be a burden to any of you. We certainly had the right to ask you to feed us, but we wanted to give you an example to follow. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command, those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Do you know that actually really is a scriptural verse? Yet we hear that some of you are living idle, slothful, lazy lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. If we got more time on Facebook than we have punching a clock, we got a serious problem. Pastor, I just thought I'd come here and hear about Jesus. You are. He wrote this. You're hearing all about Jesus. And I'm giving you some things to think about, especially stuff you're hearing out there. Yet we hear some of you are leaving idle lives uh, and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to own their own living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. I'll give you an example. Many of you have heard this. Uh, We had, as you know, most of you know, we had a food pantry that was feeding 200 families a week. We had uh, 70-something volunteers, I believe it was, Ruthie, don't let me overspeak. Wasn't it about 70-something at one point? And uh, didn't we have like even some of the Gosstown police working there and, and uh, tremendous influence. And uh, do you know where the idea for that food pantry came from? Those of you who've been around, you'll remember those, you, you know, just starting to come here, you haven't heard this story. When Robin and I came back from Bible college, um, we had nothing. And we had our children and we had, do they still have WIC? Is WIC still around? And, and f- food stamps. Easily some of the most embarrassing times in my life, but we, but I needed to take care of my kids. And there were two things in my reasoning. Number one, I paid taxes for a lot of years, and thank God for a country that has these resources. I am not talking about not having welfare. We actually are such a blessed nation, we should take care of the poor. I was poor. But this is what I said to the Lord, and I hated I hated it so much that I sacrificed and allowed Robin to go and do it because I didn't want to show him that I had food stamps. <laughs> But I said to the Lord, if you ever bless me, I promise you I'll take care of the poor. The reason why we had a food pantry is because I remembered my promise to God. And he blessed me. And that, that not having anything and being grateful for a government that could help me, I had determined, though, that I was going to work and be personally accountable. And it started with, what, what did we have? One refrigerator? This was with Jerry. One refrigerator, two refrigerators. And it, uh, yeah, and it made an awful racket. The the compressor on that there was banging and making all sorts of noise. But by the time we got done, why don't you have it anymore? Because the previous administration passed laws that made the government more accountable to giving to the poor instead of local faith organizations. That's why. And all the relationships we had with Hannaford and Walmart and Shaw's went down the tube because the government stipulated they couldn't help us anymore. That's why. So forgive me if I don't have a problem with deregulation. So what we see here is what does God think about industry and wealth? Go make it. 
It's not your job to look at the two or the five talenter. It's to take the one, the one quarter, the one gazillionth. Take it, because remember, we're citizens of heaven. And not to get jealous, but to through industry, hard work, and faith. These are laws at work every single time. And I promised him, well, pastor, you know, you know, you got a lot of stuff now. Well, you need to see my giving records too. Trust me, there are people out there that'll help you out and carry you and hold you because that's our responsibility. <clears throat> and you're here now. Oh, what a you know, greedy capitalists and oh, these people are so rotten and they're they're riding the backs of the worker. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to bring in socialism and communism. What about those greedy, evil, oppressive capitalists? Communist governments are responsible for over 100 million deaths just in the 20th century. David Noble paraphrased, and uh, he wrote a book and a whole college class, Understanding the Times. I've taught it for multiple years. All right. I understand communism and Marxism. I've been studying it for 30 years, and I taught it. And you can smell it a mile away. And it feeds on the very things we've been taught. This is why I took the time to build up what we were just talking about. Paraphrase. Communism, Marxist theory, created the great, single greatest killing machine ever developed by mankind. What about those greedy capitalists? Let me tell you something about human, fallen human nature. It doesn't matter whether it's the CEO of a corporation or a union boss. Uncontrolled pride and greed. Listen, if you don't think for a second these communist leaders aren't living in palaces while their people are going to, what's the camps that they put them in China now to get them read? They call them rethinking camps. But basically they're beating their daylights in. Oh, and by the way, if Marx was so great, you want to tell me why your brothers and sisters in communist countries have church underground? I'll let the CEO be filthy rich. At least I can praise Jesus without worrying about persecution. Wisdom is shown. Remember I said I'd quote this later? But wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. In other words, all you have to do is take time to see what something produces and whether it's right or not. That's what communism produces. That's what it produces. Because now the state, and Karl Marx was clear, all right? He's, there were two things he said. He wanted, he wanted to destroy. He wanted to destroy God, and he wanted to destroy capitalism. The DNA of the seeds of his thought was to destroy self-responsibility, growth, blessing and prosperity, and give it over to the, the state so it's distributed as the state sees best. That's being, these things are being talked about. They're all over the airwaves. There's a certain group of people that are convinced that Karl Marx has all the answers. And his ways and his means are being applied in our nation right now. This is me talking. From my own personal perspective, after studying for 30 years communist Marxist theory and practice, socialism leading to communism philosophy can go to the hell it came from. It kills people. And it destroys the individual accountability God fully expects from his creation. You can take a pile of poop and wrap it up all you want and make it look pretty and have people say whatever they want about it. You open the thing up, it's a pile of poop. And we have had over a hundred years, just Stalin was responsible, estimates, just Mr. Stalin was responsible for over 50 million of his, only, of his own countrymen's death. Don't get on the airwaves and tell me we need a new progressive agenda, which means one thing, Marx. Karl Marx. All right, we'll finish with this, and then uh, it's about a seven-minute video. How many of you are all familiar with Dr. James Dobson? 
I thought this was really, really good. James Doxson, focus on the uh, focus on the family, yeah, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people through the years he's worked with. Just and I really like how he breaks his notice. How I'm giving you time to pull the link up. Um, it's about seven minutes, and I, I agree with where he comes from because he's going to do the same thing. Uh, it's not my job to tell you who to vote for, but let him. This is what they do. You know, consolidate the the principles that are on the docket today. And then after this, if you want to have a conversation, let's have one. I insist that you want to, you, we can get passionate. And Democrat, like I'm not going to make fun of you if you're left-leaning or right-leaning, but I am going to insist on honor and respect in my house. Amen. But we have, you heard me for an hour and 10 minutes. I, I, let's have a conversation. If you want to have a conversation, let's have a conversation. This is important. The, the destiny of our country right now, there's a lot going on. Let's have a conversation if you want to have one. Let's just be honorable and respectful. And if no one wants to talk about it, then we'll be out of here. And we still would have kept it under two hours. And I'm ready for some coffee. All right. Go ahead. Put it up. Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson with the James Dobson Family Institute, and I want to share a few thoughts with you about the upcoming national election. The letter I will read in a moment was distributed to our constituents a few days before President Trump contracted the coronavirus. That was on October the 2nd. He appears to be recovering, and his name will be on the ballot, opposed to that of Vice President Joe Biden. I would not suggest how you should vote in that election. This will be my final letter to 800,000 people before Americans cast their ballots on November 3rd. It is a breathtaking moment in the history of the United States. Many political commentators have stated that this election is the most significant since 1864 when Abraham Lincoln vied for a second term against Democratic nominee George McClellan. The future of our beloved nation hung in the balance that year. If Lincoln had lost, the Civil War would have ended precipitously, and the wretched evils of slavery would have remained legal in the Confederate States and perhaps even in the North. Had Lincoln been defeated, the Union would have been torn asunder. Thank God Mr. Lincoln won, even though it cost him his life. Now we're approaching another presidential election that carries enormous implications for the stability of our democratic system of government. Indeed, Newt Gingrich said that what we are now facing might bring an end to civilization as we have known it. He may have been referring to a possible revolution. Regardless, I believe his grave concern for our nation is valid. For centuries, America has stood as a shining light for liberty and freedom. If we abandon our core values, the world will suffer for it. The binary choice before us is that stark. Now, here is the critical question. How will Americans and how will you decide how to vote for our chief executive officer? I've heard from dozens of friends and acquaintances in recent weeks who have told me they will base their decisions solely on the candidate's rhetoric, tone, style, or likability. Does that describe your thinking process just now, as I was about to react to that idea, my wife Shirley brought in an email that she had received a few minutes before from a friend. It quoted an anonymous statement that gets to the heart of the issue as follows, and I'm quoting, this is not a junior high or high school popularity contest. I'm not voting for the person, I'm voting for the platform. I'm voting for the Second Amendment. I'm voting for the next Supreme Court justice. I'm voting for the Electoral College. I'm voting for the republic in which we live. I'm voting for the police and law and order. I'm voting for the military and the veterans who fought and died for this country. 
I'm voting for the flag that is often missing from public events. I'm voting for the right to speak my opinion and not be censored for it. I'm voting for secure borders. I'm voting for the right to praise God without fear. I'm voting for every unborn soul that is at risk of being aborted. I'm voting for freedom and the American dream. I'm voting for good against evil. I'm not just voting for one person. I'm voting for the future of my country. I couldn't have said it better, although I want to add to the writer's list. I'm also voting for candidates who will exercise sound judgment internationally. I'm voting for those who will support Israel. I'm voting for those who will protect children from leftist curricula. I'm voting for the nation's fiscal integrity. I'm voting for parental rights. I'm voting for school choice and for home education. I'm voting for freedom in the suburbs. I'm voting for little sisters of the poor and other Christian organizations. I'm voting for racial unity. I'm voting to support in God we trust and school prayer. I'm voting for freedom of conscience for physicians and other professionals. I'm voting for marriage. I'm voting for life in all its dimensions. I'm voting for wisdom in handling the pandemic. I'm voting for protection for the church and oppressive politicians. I'm voting against euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. And yes, I'm voting against socialism. One final thought, and this comes from my heart. With all respect, this election isn't about you. It certainly is not about me. It's about our kids and grandkids. It's about those who are yet to come. If they're allowed to live, this vote has awesome implications for future generations and the nation we love. It is about our Constitution and the immutable God-given rights that it protects. It is about values and truth and greatness and hope. That is why the notion of choosing a president based on frivolous personality characteristics is so unfortunate. In summary, this election is for all the marbles, the presidency, the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. Together, they set the agenda for our country. If you love America and don't want it to be fundamentally transformed, it is time to do three things. Number one, pray like never before that God will spare this great nation from tyranny and oppression of religious liberty. Two, volunteer to help your candidates. Three, vote for the candidates who will best uphold your values and convictions. Also, you might consider sharing this video with your friends, family, and others whom you might influence. If you would also like to contact me, just go to drjamesdobson.org. And God bless America. And so, Father, I want to thank you for clarity for, um, for each of us, uh, for the privilege that we have. We do live in an amazing nation. And we want to thank you for all the amazing work that through hundreds of years we've not only been able to serve, but how we've survived, even when terrible evils were being practiced in our country. Terrible evils. But the root of the Christian faith and right and wrong was the fuel that caused us to fight those things. And even the arguments we're having in the streets today are there because the founders, over 50 of which had divinity degrees in education, established that we have been endowed by you, our creator. And there's right and there's wrong. Father, so I pray right now we commit our country. We're going to do our part and vote. And Father, we're going to trust all the prayers that have gone, whether we knew what we were doing or not, you have evoked in the past year so much prayer, so much worship. And I'm reminded, uh, Father, just 
hold on, you guys keep praying. There's a verse that came to me I'm going to read to you. That as I was talking to him, I was reminded I've read this before. And uh, Father, thank you. Thank you. As a result of all the prayers. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And he told me this week, and he reminded me as I've been praying about the nation, the elections, things are going on. This continually, this psalm has been coming to my heart over and over. Psalm chapter 2, Father, now I'm back to talking to you, Father. You said, why are the nations in an uproar? And why are the people devising vain things? The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Father, that means there's people today, as there were then, that take counsel to destroy what's right and wrong and a basic fear in who you are. They're saying, let us tear their fetters apart. Today, there's over, Father, as you know, and let me talk to you guys. You, if you Google this, at any given time, there's tens, if not hundreds, of litigations taking place against religious liberty in our country right now. Christians that are being litigated to try to stop the mention of God and Jesus in our culture. As a resistance, that's free speech. All right, but that's what's going on. So anyway, let us tear their feathers apart and cast away their cords. In other words, this was a psalm, the psalmist was saying even nations have gathered together to try to stop the plans and purposes of God. And all of this week, this is what's come out of my spirit, the end of this psalm. Then he will speak, uh, oh, in verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Father, you're laughing at fools. Father, I want to thank you that nations have purposes. Nations and the people of them have destinies. And Father, though the world itself, and there's going to be a guy show up for about seven years that one day he's going to think we got it all worked out. He can take care of everything. You're even laughing at him. And we know that all of this, nothing can stop your plans and your purposes. So we give it to you, Father. I trust that you're just laughing. You're rolling on the ground laughing when people say they're going to get God out of the United States. You're just laughing hysterically when the nations say they're going to stop Jesus from being king of this earth. You're laughing and you're scoffing at these people. And so, Father, I want to thank you. I'm believing for this nation that you've heard from heaven. You've heard from heaven. And that you'll restore our destiny, our freedoms, and the grace that you've called us to be. We trust you this Tuesday. And we thank you for this great, albeit imperfect, but this great nation that you've called us to live in in this time. In Jesus' name, and everyone said Amen. Hi, this is Pastor Joe again, and I trust that you enjoyed our service. I believe that you learned more about God, you learned more about His kingdom, that you understand more of His word. And at the end of the day, what makes that amazing is we can walk more close with our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if there's anything we can do to serve you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Of course, our Sunday morning services are at 10 o'clock. Our information is on the website. Please make sure you check it out. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you, serving you, journeying together with you in this generation to see the goodness of God now and forever and ever. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you real soon.